In the last video, we compared and contrasted physical properties with physical, excuse me, with chemical properties. Now we're going to compare and contrast physical changes with chemical changes. And so just like before, we're going to make two columns and put a few bullets underneath each. Physical changes versus chemical changes. And these are processes, unlike properties, which are qualities or characteristics. So they're similar concepts, but get out a very different idea. A physical change, first of all, is one that does not produce new substances. Physical changes do not produce new substances. And we know that a substance is an element or a compound. And so if there are no new elements or compounds produced, then it's a physical change that we're talking about. In examples, we can go straight to some examples would be, for instance, crushing into a powder. If I take some chalk and I crush it into a powder, then I still have chalk. Chalk is mostly calcium carbonate. And after crushing it into a powder, it's still calcium carbonate. If you shatter glass, you are not actually changing what it's made of. And I'm also going to add that all phase changes, and you might call those state changes, like between solid, liquid, and gas, are physical changes. And that's because if we, for instance, boil water, the chemical formula is still H2O. Now I'm going to put an asterisk next to this because we'll be elaborating on that a little bit later. We want to make sure we understand different phase changes um, in just a moment. But let's finish up this contrast uh, with chemical changes. And of course, if physical changes do not produce new substances, then it should make sense that chemical changes produce new substances. And it's sometimes helpful to remember that those new substances will have different properties. So if you see a change that produces a different color, then that might be evidence of a chemical change because color is a physical property. If you produce a substance that has a different um, chemical property, then we probably have produced a new substance. It's also helpful to note that chemical changes are synonymous with chemical reactions. And I'm going to sometimes abbreviate the word reaction, RxN, just another bit of shorthand that we'll use sometimes. So chemical changes are chemical reactions and examples of chemical changes or chemical reactions are gonna include things like burning, rusting, or, for instance, fermentation. And, of course, all of these produce new substances. If you burn something, you have ashes. If you allow something to rust, then you're left with an orange powder instead of a shiny metal. If something ferments, then you can usually smell the gas that's produced when it ferments. That's a new substance that wasn't there before with different chemical properties than the things we started with. It can sometimes be difficult to determine whether a chemical reaction has actually occurred or not. And so we're going to want to list signs of a chemical reaction. Now, when I list these signs or evidences of chemical reaction, I want it to be clear that these are not proof that a chemical reaction has occurred, but they are good examples of evidence of a chemical reaction. So we'll write evidence of a chemical reaction, and I'm going to put five bullets here. First of all, the formation of a gas is a sign of a chemical reaction. Formation of a gas, you might see bubbles, or you might see an odor. Or excuse me, you probably won't see an odor, but um, that can be evidence of chemical reaction. Of course, this can happen without a chemical reaction occurring. Perfume smells. Seltzer water will bubble 
That doesn't mean there's a chemical reaction taking place. There isn't in those cases, but this is evidence of a chemical reaction, not proof. Formation of a solid is called a precipitation event. A solid is also known as a precipitate, and we'll come back to that in some other examples later. So a solid that's formed during a chemical reaction is called a precipitate, and some reactions are precipitation reactions. The other evidences of a chemical change include um, unpredictable color change, and I'm going to make sure I include the word unpredictable here when I write unpredictable color change because if I mix together red and blue, I'm going to get purple. That does not mean a chemical reaction has occurred. That's a predictable color change. And then finally, we're going to include heat and light. But I want us to also take this time to learn that heat energy is also known as thermal energy. And that in a chemical reaction could mean that the reaction gets warm or the reaction gets cold. In other words, energy is transferred from the system to the surroundings or from the surroundings to the system. And finally, light energy. And light energy is also known as radiant energy. So we're going to be talking a lot more about energy soon, especially thermal energy. But these five signs of a chemical reaction are evidence that a reaction has occurred, not necessarily proof. After all, if you boil water, then you might think that some of these are occurring. We see a formation of a gas. You see maybe some thermal energy transfer associated with that process, but that's actually just a physical change because it's a phase change. So trying to distinguish whether a chemical reaction has occurred or not can be a little tricky. So this is a good time to pause for discussion, but there's one more point I'm going to include in this video. This asterisk here reminds us that we're going to want to talk a little bit more about phase changes, and so we're going to go on to that next. Let's talk about phase changes with this diagram, which we're going to draw three pictures in, and those are going to represent solid, liquid, and gas, respectively. And of course, phase changes are just transitions between these stages of states of matter or phases of matter. We call the transition from a solid to a liquid. And we call the, call the transition from a liquid to a gas. These are words that we're all familiar with, melting and evaporation or for instance, liquid to a solid is freezing. And gas to a liquid is condensation. Now, of course, all of these are physical changes because they don't involve the change in composition that uh, a chemical change describes. There are a couple of exceptional ones that are a little less commonly discussed, and one of them is what if a substance goes straight from a solid to a gas? We call that sublimation. Something like dry ice will sublime. <coughs> and there is also a term for something going straight from a gas to a solid. That's called deposition. So if you put, for instance, an object in a cloud of iodine vapor, you might see the iodine deposit on the walls of the substance. So those are all different phase changes. At the very bottom of this picture, I want us to draw an arrow going from left to right and right increasing kinetic energy. And that is because as we go from solid to liquid to gas, the particles that the substance is made of will have higher and higher amounts of kinetic energy, energy of movement. 
We'll talk more about the fact that thermal energy is really a type of kinetic energy later, um, but it is important for us to know that the gas phase is always going to be a higher energy state of matter than the liquid phase and so on. So increasing kinetic energy in that direction. Finally, in this video, I want to add one more point. We've talked about the difference between physical changes and chemical changes. We've talked about evidence of a chemical reaction. We've talked about the different types of phase change, which are, of course, all physical changes. But I want to come back to this word chemical reaction and give a little bit more information about chemical reactions. Namely, the chemical reactions can always be described by chemical equations. We're going to write that all chemical reactions can be described by chemical equations. And a chemical equation is like a sentence that describes what happens during a chemical reaction. It has a couple of components that I want us to be able to identify. So I'm going to write an example of a chemical equation. We're going to break down the anatomy of that equation. The example I'll give is the burning of methane, which is CH4. It reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. Now, before you copy this down, you'll notice that I left some spaces here, and I'm going to be adding some things in front of these formulas, especially right here and right here, I'm going to need to add what are called coefficients. And I want to explain what those are in just a moment. The first thing that we should point out about a chemical equation is that this entire sentence is the chemical equation. Whereas, of course, just this little part right here, that's a chemical formula. So let's make sure that we understand the difference between an equation and a formula. Next, I want to label what we call the reactants and the products. The reactants are the chemicals that react with each other, and the products are the things which are produced. Now, there might only be one product if a bunch of reactants combine. There might only be one reactant if one reactant decomposes, or there might be multiple reactants and multiple products like there are here. This arrow in the middle is read as yields or reacts to form. So methane and oxygen yield carbon dioxide and water. And finally, I think we already know that this little number right here is called a subscript. And of course, it's telling me how many hydrogens are in a water molecule. Or the implied invisible number one here is telling me how many oxygens are in a water molecule. But the large number right here is a coefficient. And we need to define and understand the use of coefficients. In other words, these are multipliers which are applied to a chemical formula. And I'll define a coefficient below. A coefficient is a multiplier which is applied to a chemical formula. A multiplier applied to a formula. In other words, this is telling me that two water molecules are produced. And it makes sense. If I started off with four hydrogen atoms, I couldn't possibly end up with only two hydrogen atoms. So we're not going to write H4O because there's no such thing as H4O. There must be two water molecules produced if all matter is conserved in a chemical reaction. So this has to do with the conservation of mass in chemical reactions, but it's also just an important bit of um, understanding of the anatomy of a chemical equation. We're always going to be using chemical equations to describe what happens in a chemical reaction.
A chemical reaction is simply a rearrangement of atoms in molecules or compounds. And when we rearrange atoms, we're still going to conserve all of the mass and matter. Um, there's not going to be any uh, leftover pieces that we leave out of our chemical equation. So the coefficients are going to be added in order to what we call balance the equation, to do what we call balancing the equation, to make sure that all the matter that we started with in the reactants is still accounted for in the products. So all the atoms that we begin with are still accounted for in the products. So this is an example of a chemical equation and its different um, components, reactants and products, the use of subscripts and coefficients to keep track of the identity of the substances and the number of particles involved. And we're going to use these to describe chemical reactions when we discuss them.